Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining this session. My name is Victor Varza. I'm a technical leader at Adobe, and together with my colleague Daniel, we're going to talk about uh, multi-tenant versus microclusters based on our experience of running Kubernetes in Adobe. Few words about me. I'm part of the developers productivity organization at Adobe which seems to help our customers, the developers, to write better software even faster. I'm passionate about uh, open source contributions and uh, I'm one of the authors of uh, KT Shredder. Okay. And I'm one of the authors of uh, KT Shredder and Cluster Registry, two open source software that we successfully integrated to our platform. I'm also one of the organizers of uh, KCD Romania which is the first in-person KCD event in the southeast of Europe, and which is going to happen next month. Daniel, do you want to introduce yourself and kick off the presentation? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. My name is uh, Daniel Coman. I'm a lead engineer in Adobe Experience Platform. I'm a long-time Kube follower and a first-time speaker, so be a bit kind to me. So first to understand the uh, journey with uh, Kubernetes tenancy in Adobe, I'm going to talk about how we started with uh, microclusters in Adobe Experience Platform. And Victor will explain um, about uh, how we implemented multi in uh, Project Ethos, Adobe's unified uh, compute platform. So first of all, what is Adobe Experience Platform, or for short, AEP? It's a centralized and connected data foundation that powers customer experience management across Adobe real-time CDP, customer journey analytics, and journey optimizer. It provides tools for data ingestion and data governments with AI-driven insights. It integrates with other Adobe products to offer a seamless experience for customer data management and marketing automation. So for AAP, we use a hub and spoke model. And uh, for this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the edge component outlined there. It's, it seems quite small on this uh, chart, but if you take a broader look, we can see that the edge network is quite large. This is what we call the edge network. And here is where our story begins when we were faced with the challenges of rapid regional expansion and needed to quickly spin up edge infrastructure. This uh, was a few years back when uh, Kubernetes was a relatively new technology among our developers. Project Ethos was just starting. Victor will tell us more about that. But in short, they were focused on our hub location in Asia. And for the Edge Network, the strategy was to build uh, infrastructure in AWS. So if we wanted to iterate quickly, we needed to do it independently of their efforts at that time. We started this uh, project with a team of uh, five people with some ambitious goals and tight deadlines. First of all, build uh, seven regional locations in AWS, uh, build a new infrastructure stack based on code auto automation, and quite importantly, help edge applications migration to Kubernetes. If this task wasn't enough, we were required to be in production in six months. So we knew application teams had limited exposure to the Kubernetes ecosystem, and we had limited manpower. So we needed to focus on a few important things like helping teams understand uh, Kubernetes uh, and its advantages, helping in application migrations, provide a streamline, uh, streamline onboarding experience, and something that we call offer a batteries included out of the box experience. So this is was our understanding that what mattered most was the developer experience. Uh, still infrastructure provisioning is still a crucial part of our work. We sought some shortcuts to avoid spending effort on low-level resource provisioning and maintenance. A managed solution obviously fit our needs, and within AWS, we opted for EKS. Adobe was uh, among the first to use EKS at scale back in 2018, I think, when it first became uh, generally available. We began our work on the lying infrastructure and at the same time, we started looking at what teams and services will be using this platform. These early discovery talks are a vital uh, process. This is where we... Um, 
this is where we uh, figured that if we want the team to embrace Kubernetes and succeed, we needed to give them some assurances, build up trust in the platform, in Kubernetes as a compute layer, uh, and uh, help them get some hands-on experience. That's why we decided to go use this topology, the single tenant or microcluster, how we call it. It gave us some short-term advantages like predictable performance, single tenancy gives us uh, better isolation from lazy neighbors, improved stability, improved stability. We also benefit from a simplified support matrix. It's much easier to customize application-specific configurations. It gives us simplified go governments, managing access control, permissions and policies is more straightforward in a single tenant cluster, no need to navigate complex multi-tenancy configurations. And all of this uh, allowed us to rapidly build up infrastructure and iterate. So we launched in production six months later with a shared responsibility model with application teams having full Kubernetes admin access to the cluster. This worked quite well in the beginning when teams needed to onboard their application for the first time in uh, Kubernetes. Having this level of freedom with full control over a cluster made the process a lot simpler. No complicated onboarding process, easy to, co to customize and test, access to debug the whole stack, and they were uh, loading the ropes of how things are done in, in Kubernetes. But yeah, nothing good lasts forever. We wanted to discourage teams from modifying infrastructure applications, uh, wanted them to not uh, change configurations manually, uh, and very important, they were running unoptimized compute, so over-provisioning of resources was quite a problem. In, in some cases, having too much freedom can have catastrophic consequence. We had a notable incident when a, one of our team accidentally deleted all deployments on the cluster. They had a bug in their CICD automation. We were learning some hard lessons here. So from an open garden, we started to close things up. First, we implemented access control, uh, limiting access to tenant-only namespaces. For this to work, we had to also pre-provision namespaces. Then we had a look at our costs, and we didn't like what we saw. So to enforce pro proper capacity planning and encourage responsible resource usages, we implemented quotas. Then security came knocking on our door, and we had to implement strict network policies. To further combat some misbehaving tenants, we added policy-based admission controls. As you can see, the line between what a single tenant cluster means and a multi-tenant one started to, to kind of blur at this point. So in the end, this is how one of our, uh, this is how the edge architecture ended up uh, looking like. This is one of our edge locations with one service per microcluster. In one of these clusters, there are multiple services composing those, the, the bigger service. I have to mention two noble services that uh, we help migrate in Kubernetes. The first one is stateless, it's called Conductor. It's the API gate gateway aggregation layer, layer used in AAP. And the second one is Pipeline. Pipeline is our multi-region distributed transport queue based on Kafka. This one proved to be one of the most difficult services that we had to migrate in Kubernetes. Um, this is a board's eye view of the Edge Network and Hub. This was our journey with the single tenant uh, microcluster approach. Next in Adobe, we decided to consolidate on a single platform called uh, Ethos. At this point, I'll let uh, Victor pick up the presentation. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, let's talk about multi-tenancy. I think everyone in this room knows what is multi-tenancy. How many of you are living in a multi-tenant city? I think everyone, right? We can draw an analogy with big cities where we share the same infrastructure like uh, buildings, transportations, health services, security services, and other services. Similarly, we can do with applications that are running on Kubernetes. We can imagine Kubernetes as a big city where we share, uh, where multiple tenants consume and uh, run different services. At Adobe, developers run their applications on the runtime platform named Ethos, which is a multi-tenant Kubernetes-based architecture. Along with Kubernetes, Ethos is using many other open-source software projects, such as Cilium, Prometheus, OPA Gatekeeper, Argo, Helm, and so on. This is Ethos Kubernetes platform from uh, 10,000 feet and how it stands in Adobe. 
On the top of the slide, we have the three main Adobe Clouds, Creative Cloud, Experience Cloud, and Document Cloud. These clouds are powered by Adobe software products, such as Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Firefly, Adobe Analytics, Adobe Experience Manager, Adobe Sign, and so on. And together with the platform that they are using, such as uh, Sensei Machine Learning, Adobe Content Platform, Adobe Experience Platform, all together are running on top of Ethos, and Ethos is basically the Adobe's runtime for containerized applications. To better understand the scale, here are some pretty impressive numbers. Ethos operates at three main cloud providers, Adobe Private Cloud, AWS, and Azure. Spanning 28 different cloud regions, and we are managing more than 340 Kubernetes clusters and hosting more than 1 million pods, which are running in 42,000 Kubernetes namespaces, namespaces which are owned by application development teams. In terms of computing power, the platform consumes about 3.9 petabytes of RAM memory, more than 1 million of virtual CPUs, and tens of thousands of GPUs for the AI workloads. The multi-tenancy approach at Adobe is very simple. We, we, we use multi-tenancy architecture as a, as a way to share mul multiple physical clusters with multiple teams from different projects and different organizations. And we have two types of clusters, shared clusters and dedicated clusters. Shared clusters are available to any internal Adobe team <coughs> and are highly valuable for optimizing the cost and enhancing the overall platform reliability. Dedicated clusters started, started based on the idea of uh, micro clusters are used for two main purposes. When high, society, when high security isolation is required, such as for applications that can run untrusted software. For instance, we have Adobe Experience Manager, which is a content management system solution that needs to run software written by Adobe customers. Another scenario is when a specific team requires high resource demand and customizations for their workload that needs the entire cluster. An example of this is Adobe Experience Manager that needs to run highly scalable and stateful apps such as Kafka event streaming platform. Even if we are referring to multi-tenant or single-tenant cluster, the workload isolation on ethos is the same. We rely on Kubernetes namespaces and a couple of Kubernetes objects to provide a minimal isolation within the cluster. For this, we are using the concept of namespace profile template, which we predefine and control, and which is made of few Kubernetes objects, such as Kubernetes namespace to group objects for a single theme within a Kubernetes API, cluster roles and role binding to ensure that only a specific team has access to a particular namespace, Quota and limit range for controlling and limiting resource consumption, ensuring fair resource distribution within a cluster, and network policies and Cilium network policies for the network isolation. And the reason that we are using Cilium network policies is because we need by default some um, uh, DNS-based policies and other layer 7 policies. The onboarding process to ETHOS platform is pretty easy. The user just needs to specify some custom values, such as the namespace name, the admin, edit, and uh, view LDAP groups, the clusters where the namespace is going to be deployed, and the namespace profile template. And the namespace profile template is rendered and deployed on the clusters, and the tenant can, de can deploy his application inside. And the tenant application's Kubernetes objects will be restricted only to a specific team and the pods will be isolated by the default network policies. From the developer's perspective, the multi-tenancy architecture is just an isolated namespace where he can deploy his application inside. But there is an overhead that comes with multi-tenancy, which is not necessarily seen by the end users. First, we had to implement the namespace isolation with the namespace profile template concept. Then we need to have some governance policies at the cluster level in order to safeguarding teams against inter space collisions and ensuring the stability of the clusters 
by preventing a team from compromising the entire cluster. And in order to implement this po these policies across the cluster fleet, we are using the OPA Gatekeeper framework. And a basic example of such as policies is um, validating the ingress objects use a unique FQDN within a cluster. Capacity management is a key consideration in multi-tenancy because capacity issues may result in higher costs. We measure capacity at the namespace level using the Kubernetes quota object and at the cluster level using the Prometheus alerts. So we added capacity alerts in Prometheus that automatically stop onboarding when the cluster reaches the capacity in terms of number of nodes, number of available IPs that can be assigned to a worker nodes, number of ingress objects, and so on. Another point that needs to be considered in multi-tenancy is non-disruptive infrastructure changes. Our platform evolved during the time and we started onboarding more and more teams so the workload diversity expanded and now <clears throat> we are hosting sensitive stateful apps such as uh, databases or uh, Kafka. And we had some outages in the past caused by the cluster upgrades th that made us to conclude that pod disruption budgets alone are not enough. We aim to achieve the rotation of the worker nodes while ensuring the availability of the tenant applications and keep the infrastructure cost within a reasonable limits. So we come up with an open source solution named Kate Shredder that implements Park Nodes Upgrade Strategy. And if you are interested to learn more about this solution, I recommend you to have a look on GitHub under Adobe's uh, organization. A multi-tenant Kubernetes-based platform should be even more cost efficient. We are analyzing if the workloads that are running on a tenant namespaces are compliance with ETO standards that could impact the cost, reliability, and the security of the overall platform. For example, regarding to the pod disruption budgets, we've seen many deployments not having the PDBs associated, or on the opposite, have the PDB set to zero disruptions allowed. Another example is misconfigured liveness and readiness probes. You'll be surprised, but not all of the developers add the right liveness and readiness probes for the applications. We are also looking for the CPU and memory request settings, and uh, we make sure that the pods have the right size of the CPU and memory request based on their historical data. So these are the points that uh, represent the overall um, multi-tenancy overhead that could be complex to set up at scale. And now I'm going to pass it back to Daniel for the conclusions. So a few takeaways from our journey with running multi-tenant, single-tenant clusters in Adobe. There is no silver bullet for building a Kubernetes platform. You should always align with your organization needs and specific requirements. It's quite essential to acknowledge that challenges faced when uh, operating at scale can differ quite significantly from those encountered in small and medium-sized platforms. For us, both solutions work, but we understand that efficiency uh, in cost and scalability from running multi-tenancy at scale, um, and on the other hand, microclusters with single tenancy can help your organization to grow faster because it provides better customization opportunities and simply it's easier to set up. So thank you for your presentation. Um, if you have um, uh, any feedback for us, please scan uh, the QR code, and we are open for any questions. Okay, sweet. Thank you for the talk. Um, have you seen when you move to shared a situation where because um, the pods are all being sent in the same node and there might be situations where you have like the bandwidth of the network be affected even though they might be using a low amount of cores but the shared network is an issue on the pods? Thank you for the question. So the question is if we've seen uh, 
some performance issues while moving from single tenant to multi tenant cluster? Well, it depends. Before the teams are moving from uh, single tenant to multi tenant, uh, they are doing some benchmarking. So they are testing their applications. So uh, here it depends. Some, some teams remain on the single tenant clusters because we still provide the single tenant so, uh, offering, but they, uh, they can also move to, to multi tenant if. For example, they don't have so much spikes that could uh, do some noise in uh, performance to the other tenants. I, I can say also, yes, we've seen some, uh, we, we, when we talk about I.O., that's uh, a network I.O. especially, that's hard to uh, provide quotas for that. Uh, and we still use, we still have Kafka deployed in a single tenant configuration. Hey, thank you for the presentation. That was very interesting. Uh, so you said you started the team with five people and now you are managing 340 clusters. Uh, how, how big is your team right now? And uh, I have a second question. Did you study the node pool solution, like segregating uh, the workload, not on different clusters, but just different nodes? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So um, the project with five people was actually the Daniel's project where, where they started to iterate fast using only EKS and single tenant or micro clusters. Then uh, in order to provide the scale, they migrate their solution to Ethos platform, which is the, let's say, uh, the standard runtimes platform for Adobe to run um, uh, containers, let's say. Um, so, um, yeah, it was a different uh, approach. They, they just started with small team to iterate fast. Do you want to add? Something? So, how many people are running Ethos right now? How many engineers? I don't know. More than five or four. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like 20, yeah. 50. Something like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so ten, I think 10 times more than we were we, back then. Yeah. In, my, in my company, we're managing like uh, five clusters and we are 10 people. So, I was like, okay, that's a, that's a very good it, five people for let's go. It, it was hard, but uh, that's that's why single tenancy worked for us. I mean, it was easier than what these guys did. So, <laughs> and for and for the second question, you said that uh, if we are using uh, some dedicated nodes within a cluster for for some tenants, uh, yes, we provide this solution, but not for a single tenant. Let's say. Uh, or let's say a feature, uh, most likely, like uh, they want to run GPUs and we will only have uh, nodes with GPUs and uh, only post that requires GPUs can run on, door, on, those, uh, on those nodes. So um, we don't do multi-tenancy, I mean, multi-tenant clusters with uh, isolated tenants per nodes. If they need to isolation, strict isolation, they just move to a single tenant cluster. Okay, thank you. Another thing about uh, node pools, so we are not th only thinking about uh, compute power here. You have the Kubernetes control plane, and in a multi-tenant cluster, you have a lot more objects that put pressure on that, and HCD and other components. So that's another reason that you will, like, even if you don't have a, a large number of nodes, the control plane might, might be more fitted to, to be a single tenant. Hi, um, over here. Uh, thanks for your presentation, first of all. It was very interesting. Um, you mentioned that you're uh, still having shared clusters as well as dedicated clusters. Now, you mentioned all these um, security improvements that you made to the shared clusters to make sure customers don't impact each other. Do you still see like a technical reason, especially security-wise, to still stick with uh, dedicated clusters? So do you see a concrete advantage here, or is this more of a compliance thing? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, very good question, actually. Um, we remain the we, we led the, the, the tenants that actually landed first on the single tenant cluster to just use that single tenant cluster because they had some let's say security concerns, and uh, they scale so big that they just need the entire cluster. Uh, so I don't say it's necessarily a security concern of running on a single tenant cluster, but it was at the beginning. Um, yeah, so. 
I think right now single tenant and multi tenant provide the same security as we put it here in the in this slide. The security is almost uh, the same. Probably it's more complex to do it uh, in multi tenant. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you too. I think we, we can we can get one more. Oh, we finished. If not, we can take the questions offline. It's okay. I got one quick question. Yeah, sure. You guys were talking about microclusters. What exactly is a microcluster? Mm -hmm. Very good question, Daniel. Yeah. So uh, in the edge, we had some applications that only took up like three nodes, uh, three compute nodes. That's what's the micro part of it. It's, it's single tenant, but it's also very small. And it's uh, it, the domain of the cluster. It's a, a single service, which might have like three or four microservices, but it's basically dedicated to a single team. That's the concept of it. You okay. map, you map micro, the cluster. Micro, micro cluster is a small single tenancy cluster. Yes, yes, it's mapped to a single service and to a single team. So a team has full access to it, and you know, we, we map one team, one service to one cluster. Okay. Even if it's three compute nodes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think we are on time. Thank you for, uh, for your questions. Uh, if you have other questions, we can take them offline, no problem. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.